Okay. Well, welcome everyone to this discussion. Um, on behalf of Atheists United and in conjunction with Humanists International, we're pleased to host this discussion with Sarah Hader and with Sarah Henry. Um, Mubar this is about Mubarak Bala, who has, he is a fellow humanist from Nigeria, head of the Nigerian humanists. And um, he has been in jail for uh, roughly three weeks for his offense of, of blasphemy. And uh, we, as far as I, as far as uh, the information that I have is we don't uh, have much communication with him. Um, there are probably some things going on behind the scenes at Humanist International and that uh, we're not privy to, but um, so far, um, my sense is that he, there is still a dire danger for him and we're still very concerned about him. So, um, Sarah Hader uh, is going to be talking about um, Muslim, ex-Muslim support for Mubarak um, and a little bit uh, bio about on Sarah is um, Sarah Hader is a Pakistani American writer, speaker, and political activist. She created the advocacy group Ex Muslims of North America, which seeks to normalize religious dissent and to help former Muslims leave the religion by linking them to support networks. She's the co founder and director of development for Ex Muslims of North America. So, welcome, Sarah Hader, and I'll let um, Sarah Henry take it away. Great. So the way we um, wanted to do this tonight is sort of an interview style uh, talk. So we can learn more about Sarah's work and the work of ex-Muslims as well as sort of how that impacts um, the rest of us and, and our advocacy. Uh, and I've said this a lot of times and we'll continue to. If you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the Zoom chat. And myself, um, Christine and Sarah Levin, because there's never enough Sarahs on one phone call, we'll uh, be monitoring those and making sure we're able to get to those we can. Um, great, so Sarah, if you could go ahead and um, it would be great to hear a little bit about how you got involved in this kind of work and what is your sort of personal history? What motivated you to create XMNA? Well, um, yeah, thank you for hosting this, by the way. I think it's incredible um, cause to raise yeah, awareness sorry. for. Um, how many, how many uh, of these uh, calls have you guys been doing so far? Hello? Yeah, Christine, I've been oh, on. Um, I, I was looking look at something. Um, we had, um, I believe, two other uh, calls last week. Um, Oh gosh, we had a discussion with Humans International on an update that was, uh, I believe it was last week. Mm -hmm. Actually, that, I think we just had one since. This is our second one now that I think okay. about it. Okay, okay. Um, well, for those who are not aware of myself and my work, um, the short uh, summary is that um, I left Islam when I was a teenager. I found it to be quite difficult and there was a lot of social stigma. Um, and I didn't know any other ex-Muslims. Um, and at that time, even the word ex-Muslim was totally unknown to most people. Um, and I think that the, the only ex-Muslim I could even think of was Ayan Hirsi Ali. Um, so that it wasn't really something that was popular. Um, and um, I found it to be quite difficult when I, when I left. Um, even though I come from a relatively liberal family and I say relatively liberal, I always, I always make it a point to say that it, it, my family was relatively liberal, which is to say by standard American standards, they were quite, quite conservative. Um, but compared to the average Muslim, I think I was given a level of freedom not afforded to many, uh, especially many women. Um, so I, I left the religion um, and um, uh, started growing up and uh, leaving my community behind. Um, I encountered uh, the first sex Muslim ever as an adult, and I found it to be a really enriching and amazing experience. I didn't know there would be anybody like me from my communities, um, uh, from my community, uh, and we decided that we were going to do something about this and start to have a community support network for, for ex-Muslims, and that was sort of the proto ex-MNA. Um, and as we, as we continue to do these support 
support meetings, uh, we found that people were just, um, I mean, this was such a lifeline for, for some people who were coming in from 10 hours away, like one way, just to just to be there and have a happy hour for two hours with us. Um, and it was just uh, really uh, incredible what was what was going on and how much people needed uh, something so casual, just a, just a place to be themselves for two hours. Um, a lot of times we would, um, and actually, I, I think every single one of the first, uh, you know, six or seven meetings, I remember somebody breaking down in tears because it was just so cathartic experience to be there with, uh, with others who had been through similar experiences. Um, and then we quickly realized that this needed to be an organization that was bigger than just this, that we need to foster community and support everywhere. And we also needed to advocate on behalf of ex-Muslims in a broader sense and educate the public about dissent from Muslim communities and what ex-Muslims face um, and what ex-Muslims look like um, in, the, in, our, in our general, um, you know, our general experiences. And so um, ex-Muslim North America has been operating since 2013. Um, and now we, we, we do much more than just put together uh, support communities. We have video projects, uh, we do research, um, activism on, in various ways. Uh, we held events for about two years. We were going to college campuses regularly. Now we go a little less regularly um, and hold host panel events um, about ex-Muslim issues and Islam and criticism and free speech and women's rights and all of that. Great. Yeah, every, I feel like every time I log on to social media, ex-Muslims has a new campaign or project, I'm always seeing something. So definitely keeping busy. Um, great, thank you so much. So I think there's often a challenge in, for folks who don't have experience with or a knowledge of Muslim communities. I know growing up, I was, grew up in a very homogenous white Christian community and didn't meet, you know, someone who identified as Muslim, let alone ex-Muslim until I was an adult. And so I think that's sort of a broader sense across the United States and certainly across communities that looked like mine. Um, can you give us like a peek into what the experience can be like for people who are leaving either an insular or, or even not so insular Muslim community? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think, it, it, Unfortunately, I would say many, if not most, uh, Muslim communities in the West are insular um, to a degree that is probably not healthy, um, definitely is not healthy. Uh, and some of that is just due to the dynamics of uh, being immigrants in the West um, and feeling, uh, feeling you know, as if they're outsiders and a place of protection with others like them. So some of those really make sense from an immigrant uh, point of view and also from the point of view of people who are often, um, you know, of color. Uh, uh, so from that perspective, the insularity isn't um, completely unexpected. However, there are elements of it that the religion adds into, feeds into, that can definitely lead to very toxic circumstances for people who are uh, within those communities, especially people who are dissenting from within those communities or trying to break out of those communities. Um, and I often say that they're, because they are, you know, people of color and immigrants, they often experience hostility from the outside. So there are pressures from the outside to remain insular and on the defensive. And there are pressures from the inside also to remain uh, pure, uh, especially, you know, from a religious context where Western lifestyle, um, especially values like women's equality and, you know, sexual freedom, uh, reproductive freedom can often be seen as a corruptive um, and you know, corrosive of, of religious mores and of a pure way of life. So there, are, there, are, you know, pushes and pulls and in, in going in one direction, which is to say to to create this atmosphere where the community is extremely insular, and uh, those who grew up within it um, and want to leave have a very very hard time managing outside of of the community. They also don't have support networks. They don't have uh, you know, uh, people who, who they can count on or trust. So they're really out on their own and, um, when they leave. And um, well, last year, actually, I, I co-founded another organization um, called the Rights and Religious Forum. And um, uh, this forum I, I formed with um, two women who also had experiences with insular communities. We found like we had a lot in common. One was a Orthodox uh, 
former, former um, actually she was Hasidic, former Hasidic uh, Jew who founded uh, the organization Footsteps to help people leave um, Orthodox Judaism. And uh, another one, another woman was, the other woman was um, from an Amish background. Um, and we found that we had a lot in common and from the perspective of hyper insular communities um, and the, the co coercive social effects that are often just, they just go under the, uh, un are swept under the rug. Um, it's so easy to ignore what is going on within these communities because there's no spotlight. No one wants to really hear what's going on. And so we, we formed this organization to, to highlight what's going on within some of these insular religious communities. And we found that it's just, um, it, the term that I liked a lot was that even, even though many of us are born in the United States where, you know, native immigrants, which I thought was a very interesting term, um, you know, because for the, the Hasids, for the Amish, you know, even sometimes English isn't their first language. Um, and the communities are so isolated that the outside world feels very foreign um, and it is very, very difficult uh, to grow beyond it. Their um, education, um, life skills, all of that have been um, hampered to this degree that leaving seems intimidating on more than just an intellectual level. Right. Wow. That's obviously hyper challenging and, and I think such a unique set of circumstances that even folks leaving other sort of insular religious communities in the United States don't necessarily experience just, especially what you have to say about being the, combining that sort of religious experience with the immigrant experience or, or even just looking like a non-white American mm -hmm. um, that sort of closes off so many of those support networks to folks who are trying to leave. Yeah, it just sort of comes together to, to create a really uh, bad situation for people who are trying to dissent from within the community. Um, in that immediately you're, you're considered as kind of a native informant, you know, and the community feels they're on the defensive, they feel as if they're on the attack from the outside, um, from, you know, bigots and mainstream society. Um, and so they have this posture that is not really very conducive to being tolerant and open for, for criticism, even from the inside, even from people who love them and care for them. Mm -hmm. Wow. So one of the reasons we wanted to do sort of the timing of this is intentional, uh, is like Christine was saying, this case of Mubarak Bala. So M Mubarak Bala is a, um, for those of you who don't know, or, or maybe joined a few minutes late, he's a um, activist and writer, uh, and also the president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria. And a month ago today, Mubarak was arrested in his home um, on unspecified charges uh, and has been held without access to his legal team in Nigeria since um, that arrest. And, and I know Evan has shared a lot of information with the members of Atheists United, but we can certainly share more. Um, I can add the links in the chat as well. Um, but uh, so Mubarak left, his, left Islam in 2015 um, and one of the, sorry, I think it's 2014 actually. Um, one of the challenges that he had when leaving the, this community was that his father was a prominent religious figure in the community that Mubarak still lived in at that time. Um, so can you speak a little bit to the role that either familial support or I think more often the lack thereof um, plays in a person's ability to both leave uh, to leave Islam and then to stay safe after leaving? Well, I, unfortunately, what often happens is the people that you're most worried about, um, both in terms of, you know, hurting them um, and hurting their honor and reputation within the community, uh, but also uh, people you are afraid of are your family members. And um, this is a very sick reality for many ex-Muslims. Um, especially many, many women, many young women. Um, and we've uh, assisted many women leaving their homes in emergency circumstances, um, having to run away, you know, in the, in the dead of night uh, without telling anyone. Uh, and some of these were grown women, but they were just so afraid of what was, uh, what might happen to them. And so, uh, and felt that as if they couldn't do this without, without a security net. 
um, around them. Uh, and it's just, it's one of those things you think would not happen in the United States and wouldn't be necessary in the United States, but it certainly is. Um, and our goal, of course, in, as, ex, as ex-Muslims in North America is, is to create an environment, a social environment uh, in which this is no longer necessary, to have enough understanding in the Muslim community or enough tolerance, at least, for the dissent that, that they don't react in, in such a way um, that creates this, this very scary situation for a lot of people. Um, and I think that is also something that, especially initially when um, these issues of honor violence were first coming to the fore in the West, it was not easy for, uh, say, uh, therapists, professionals, um, uh, law enforcement professionals to, to understand that, uh, that the family is often uh, the, the, the people who are the, the um, ex-Muslims are most afraid of. and. Mm-hmm. Leg- and should be most afraid of, um, and that's not that's not something intuitive to most people. That's uh, for 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 obvious reasons. It's not intuitive, but it is something that's common within um, the m- many Muslim communities. Um, and so that over time, unfortunately, this is a lesson that they've learned in in the UK and increasingly in the United States that honor violence is a real thing, and it is it it uh, that therapists and um, law enforcement officials should pay attention to what the children are saying, especially if they say that they are worried about going back home for what might seem like a silly reason, um, right. like not wearing the hijab or, or having been caught with a boyfriend um, or a girlfriend and, and or, or you know, some atheist book um, because somebody's snooping on their social media. It's, it's hard for the average person to understand what what kind of a dire circumstance that child might be in. Um, and so often we, we try to intervene when, when situations like this occur um, because we feel like therapists and law enforcement professionals often give inappropriate advice um, or take inappropriate measures in these circumstances. Um, we once helped um, uh, this man who's, well, now, now he's uh, on his own and, and doing a wonderful job. Uh, his name is Jamal. We did a video on, on his case and it's on YouTube if anyone wants to see it. Um, in our YouTube, in our series called Life Beyond Faith. Um, well, Jamal, uh, when, he was, when he was young, he uh, experienced severe abuse from his family and he managed to run away when he was 16 years old. And he was quite afraid of them uh, and what would happen if he returned. Um, the police found him and they were going to do what they normally do when a minor runs away from home, which is that they were going to return him back to, to his family and to his, to his parents, especially since they didn't have any you know, criminal records or anything, any, any reason for them to be you know, ultimately afraid of what, what the child might be going through. Um, and you know, they, were, they were about to do that, but he explained himself and it just so happened. And he says that he's so lucky that this is what happened. It just so happened that the officer that found him was an ex-Mormon who wow. had who had experienced his own, you know, uh, uh, exper- uh, running away, I guess, of sorts, but leaving his community and understood the danger that Jamal was in. Right. Um, and so instead of taking him home, took him to uh, a shelter and gave him information about how to... Um, how to uh, get uh, guardianship, I guess, what's, what's the uh, emancipation, mm-hmm. um, so that he could be legally emancipated as, as a 16 year old and he did get his emanci- emancipation. So it was just pure luck that yeah. he happened to, to find an, a, a police officer who coming from also an insular background understood exactly what the stakes were in that moment and took the appropriate measures there. Wow, I, I mean, that's so fortuitous. I, I imagine it's a goal of yours and other ex-Muslim advocates to increase that understanding among law enforcement mm-hmm. officers and, and social workers and first responders of all mm-hmm. kinds. Mm-hmm. It's just so non-intuitive. So, so long as it's something that's occurring, that, that this is a possibility and they're aware that this may be a possibility, then that's, um, that's so much better than, than it not occurring at all, because then they might be more receptive to, to certain indicators that this is, this is a serious situation or this is not a situation uh, mm-hmm. as, you know, as normally presented to them um, when it's a non ex-Muslim. Yeah. So I think one of the things you spoke about a little bit earlier in that, that answer that definitely speaks to my experience sort of growing up 
is this idea that in the West, and especially in the United States, we think of freedom of religion as so inherent that it's often not especially, not even intuitive, but it, it doesn't even come to mind right away that um, someone leaving faith could be, leaving a faith group or a faith community could be putting their life in jeopardy. Um, and I mean, so I grew up, like I said, super conservative town as a, as a pretty out and frankly, pretty angry atheist <laughs> um, and definitely received my fair share of backlash, but uh, on the whole, very few, almost, I mean, none, no death threats. Um, and I think I sort of had that understanding that most folks in the West who are leaving religion or switching religions have that same experience. Um, and I know that's not necessarily accurate, but do you think it's easier for people to leave the, the faith of their upbringing when it is that sort of insular Muslim community in American communities or Western Europe? I think that's a, a preconception that a lot of people have, and I certainly did. Well, it's, it's, it's different. Um, mm -hmm. It's easier in some ways and, and harder in others, and that and, and some of those are obvious, right? It's easier, obviously, because of the because of what you said that we have values and norms that we often take for granted. Um, and children, even though you know, even if they are in insular Muslim communities, unless they are never meeting anybody outside of uh, their religious community, uh, they will probably also have absorbed some of these norms and feel as if these are rights that they should have. And then at some point, it occurs to them that they don't have it, or um, you know, uh, and an, a knowledge and understanding of the natural world in a way that might uh, not really correspond with, with religion, so it gets them to think critically about it. So I think there are so many ways in the West where that opportunity to critically engage with and examine religion come up, you know, naturally, just, just uh, passively um, while, you're, while you're living here, um, that from the perspective of that process of leaving faith intellectually, that certainly I think is, is easier and, and faster and more natural um, in the West. Um, but uh, the social, the social context is different. I mean, on the, of course, there's no state persecution here. So we are very, very lucky that we are not afraid of the state. And if anything, the state is here to protect us, um, that we can count on law enforcement to, when they understand what is happening to, <laughs> right. to, to, to protect us in, instead of the other way around, which is that that's who we're worried about and that's who we're afraid for. Um, the, the, where it gets a little bit murkier is when we're talking about the purely social context of, uh, of the way the communities behave. Um, so from that perspective, it, it, it does differ based on the Muslim community. There are some Muslim communities in the United States that are extremely insular and, they, uh, and, and people who come from those communities are quite afraid. Um, we have many ex-Muslim, uh, Somali, Somali ex-Muslim members um, who come from communities where they're very, very afraid of what might happen to them. They're very, very afraid of what might happen to their parents um, as well and the community pressure that might be, uh, that, that might fall upon them. Uh, so it, it, it varies um, in the United States as well. And as I said, there's that, there's that minority majority uh, or minority um, uh, pressures um, that, that influence people to be quieter about their descent um, which might not seem intuitive, but it's but, but that is what happens because you feel defensive. Um, you feel as if you want to protect your parents, protect your community from you know a, a bigotry or racism. So maybe you won't be so loud about the the things that you see all around you that might not be very healthy. Um, but of course, in 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 uh, in the East, in Muslim majority countries. The situation is very different in terms of mob violence, which is a very, very real, uh, very real threat. So even something like be being outed on Facebook, being outed on social media can be a quite threatening, a quite dangerous thing for anyone, anyone to, to, to be in. Um, and it's, th that's what astounds me that despite that, despite the fact that there's, you know, a real threat of mob violence, there's a real set threat of sometimes state persecution or just uh, these other actors and organizations that are that are that are throughout you know running in their societies um with a level of freedom and have a level of strength that they just do not have in the west that there are still people that who are standing up and talking about these issues there's still humanists and atheists and free thinkers 
who are standing up within these um, these countries. It's it's shocking to me that anyone can be so courageous um, and 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 stand anyway. And so I think there is a duty for us in the West who do have it easier in so many ways, and we have protections that they 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 would that they are fighting for. Um, you know, we should be standing up, and we should be at the very least assisting them how we can. Yeah, I, I think that's been one of the things working on. I think that's part of the reason it's been such an honor working on the Mubarak Bala case and doing so much of the, the communications and media work around that is that I, you know, I have myself and other activists like me and, and Evan have never been really put in a position where just posting a Facebook status could be enough to, to sort of prompt that kind of violent reaction. Um, certainly not physically violent to that extreme anyways. And Mubarak and people like him, other activists involved in the Humanist Association of Nigeria and, and other communities sort of across the world, um, it doesn't, there never is a second thought or if it is, it, that second thought certainly is in public. Um, that, mm. that, that there's that need to stand up for people whose voices aren't being heard. Mm -hmm. um, so we just have one more question and then we'll move to the Zoom um, chat questions. So if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask either Christine about Atheists United and their work or Sarah about ex-Muslims of North America and their work, um, if you could put it in the chat and I know there's a bunch already there and we'll be going through those as well. Um, so Sarah, you said, uh, and I certainly agree, we have a lot of responsibility as people who carry the privilege of being in the United States now for those of us who are here in the United States or being in otherwise, um, so, you know, so-called liberated or Western communities uh, to stand up and, and speak on behalf of a lot of these folks who don't necessarily have the ability to do so. Um, so what can we do? How best can we support your work and the needs of ex-Muslims around the globe? Well, I mean, there's the, there's the, uh, clear ways of helping, like helping them directly, the humanists of Nigeria and groups like that and raising their vo voices and um, sharing their content when we can. Um, all of that is super helpful, really helps get the message out. A lot of these groups don't have a lot of institutional power and, and, and strength and off, often they're not old organizations, of course, they're very, very young. And then also very, uh, you know, it's, it's a, they're, they're in a very precarious situation so whatever help we can give them institutionally is always is always really beneficial. On a broader societal level, um, you know, I always wish that it, that more people will take on the critical engagement of Islam um, as as an ideology, right? As as a claim of of you know this is how we think that the world is. This is what we think reality actually looks like. But to take them up on that instead of just viewing it and observing it as this foreign you know, uh, interesting tradition for uh, for us to just observe on the outside. And I think that part of accepting Muslims as, you know, equal citizens in the West is to take them on in and critically engage them in the way that we would anyone else. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's really, that's, th that means that we are taking them as we, you are citizens just as we are, we belong to the same society, and we should talk about uh, these values, and we should talk about, um, you know, the effect of this of of this religion and this um, belief system. Um, so, and I think there's there's such a gap there. Um, I mean, in in academia, there's a huge gap where there's there's uh, kind of a isolated group of Muslim scholars, and they uh, do their own thing. They 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 write, uh, they engage with each other, and then there's the rest of academia that doesn't really engage with them directly. Um, in any kind of a way, even if not even, I, I would say critically is, 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 I would, I would hope they would engage critically, but they don't even engage at all often. Um, mm. It's just a sphere that exists on its own. And that makes it more dangerous. Um, and, in, and in fact, there are, there are questions that we should be asking uh, religious leaders and things that we should be holding them to account for. Um, and they should be making changes if they need to be making changes uh, within the way that their religion is practiced or within the way that their tradition is understood. If, uh, but they will only do that if we pressure them to do that, if we you know, ask them the questions that need to be asked. Great, and I mean, as you know, many of us in our communities certainly don't shy away from criticizing the yeah. <laughs> 
dangerous and, and bigoted aspects of lots of religious groups. And I agree, we can't, we can't let anyone sort of slide. Um, great. Okay, so we're going to move to the Zoom questions now. Thank you so much. And we're about halfway through our time. Um, and, and the end is a little flexible, but I know people want their evenings too. So um, great. So our minority communities within Islam from larger groups like Shia to smaller ones like Amadis, I'm sure I pronounced that incorrectly, um, are they more or less likely to have healthy ways to handle dissent? That's um, the idea, Sarah. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think it, it just tends to be that minority Muslim populations are more flexible to, to dissent. And that's, I think that's just um, a hangover from being uh, minorities in Muslim majority countries and understand and having that dynamic um, to coming here and continuing to be minorities. We found that our members who are Shia members, like former Shias, um, experience less abuse, or, or uh, that's uh, uh, reportedly, they, they say that they, they experience less abuse when they're leaving. So that might indicate that at least in the Shia, from the, from the Shia perspective, that they have it less, slightly less, um, less bad. But of course, uh, it depends so much on the specific context. Because we, we have Shia members whose families were part of Hezbollah, and so they didn't have it. Uh, right. very easy obviously when they when they left so it does it does depend a little bit on the circumstance however that has been my general experience um the Ahmadiyya are different um that's a that's a whole different can of worms they're very community oriented which is a good thing but it's also a bad thing um in terms of that so social controls are often stronger um than 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 they might be outside of the Ahmadiyya uh, community so like everything else, a lot of variants. A lot of variants. <laughs> Great. Can you speak to the phrase ex-Muslim? What does that mean to you and to your group? Yeah, you know, when we started the, the organization um, and decided to call it ex-Muslims in North America, we got a lot of pushback. Um, and we got pushback from humanist groups, too. Then they, they said, I remember um, one, you know, prominent uh, leader saying, that he thought that it was uh, quite an aggressive um, name and he thought it was wow. aggressive to say that. And, you know, we were a little bit shocked by, by that sentiment, but I guess I understand it and that it's, it, it seems as if it's we're against Muslims, um, but that's not quite what's happening here. Um, why we insist on being called ex-Muslims and not just atheists and humanists, although that's what we are, human, humanists or atheists or free thinkers. Um, we call ourselves ex-Muslims as a political statement in itself. Um, and I think the name, the reason I hold on to that label, ex-Muslim, is not because it's better than uh, atheist or humanist in describing me. In fact, I would prefer those terms in terms of how to describe me. But so long as it is the case that it is, uh, you know, illegal to be an ex-Muslim, that it is illegal to apostatize uh, in many parts of the world, I feel like it's very important to be out front and very, very, very upfront about uh, about the fact that this is a religion that I have left and I have every right to leave and I have every right to leave any religion and then change my mind again if I want. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's definitely a political statement uh, to to call ourselves ex-Muslims. Great, yeah, I, that's so interesting to hear you say. I came into the movement sort of just after XMNA's founding and and presence at all of the big sort of conferences and movement events and I think has been your group has been such a staple in my secular movement experience that it's interesting to hear there was some pushback at first um hopefully not hopefully less now <laughs> less now and it's, it's a much more normalized term now I think so mm -hmm. so it doesn't uh it's it's not as bothersome to people but I think we were, we were just a new phenomena it was a new thing people didn't know what to make of us and hopefully we've had uh, some effect in educating people with what ex-Muslims are. And certainly at, at, in the beginning, there was a little bit of a concern that, um, it, well, we might be, you know, too right wing or, you know, that, that there might be, uh, uh, politically, there might, we not, might not be aligned with what the rest of the humanist community and atheist community generally tend to be. 
And so that was a difficult thing to, difficult bridge to cross as well. But I think that we've made a lot of progress there as well, that even though there's a lot of people who still think that we're too, too much on the wrong end politically for, 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 for them, that they do understand that, that ex-Muslims are, are on a spectrum just like everyone else. And there's many ex-Muslims who are very much in line with progressive values. And in fact, the majority are um, in line with uh, progressive values. So there's a question, I'll give you a break from talking for a second here. There's a question about Mubarak's case specifically. Um, what is the latest information regarding Mubarak and, and his sort of contact with family and legal team? Um, unfortunately, there's uh, almost no information available about Mubarak's case. Um, so like I said, it's been a month to the day since he was arrested. Um, since then, he's not been able to speak to his legal team, despite the fact that he does have a legal team. Uh, he's not been able to speak with his family. Um, and uh, in fact, even his whereabouts and condition are not known at this moment. Um, we're sort of in flux because Nigeria does have a standard that charges must be levied against um, detained persons within 24 hours, uh, like most countries. Um, obviously that didn't happen. And so there's sort of an ongoing debate about what that means and how we can, how his lawyers can best support him without being able to speak to him. Um, right now, what you can do to assist the release of Mubarak Bala, uh, we've spoken with a few other activists on the ground in Nigeria, as well as Humanist International. So I highly encourage you to go to freemubarakbala.org. That's the campaign that's affiliated with Humanist International and is working directly off the most recent information. Um, there you can sign the statement of support that Humanist International is using uh, in its conversations with Nigerian leadership. Um, your name, you don't have to publicize your name or the fact that you signed it, just uh, having a concrete number of people is very useful in those conversations. Um, but you can also share your uh, anger and frustration at this situation online on social media um, using the hashtag Free Mubarak Bala. And there are three Nigerian um, leadership, so uh, the Minister of Justice, the president and um, the police force, their Twitters are, their Twitter handles are located on the freemubarakbala.org page. And uh, if you can tag them on Facebook or social, on uh, Twitter or Facebook or your social media channels, um, Humanist International and our activists in Nigeria believe that international attention uh, and pressure is really the way to ensure that um, attention is brought to this case. Uh, you can also reach out to your elected officials, governments from the United States, so Ambassador Brownback here in the United States, as well as the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, um, has reached out to Nigerian leadership, as, has, as have many other countries and their sort of religious freedom teams. So look up who those folks are in your country and um, ask them to, to make a stand or to send a letter. Um, much of the world has been very involved in this campaign, more so than, than this is a unique opportunity because often the folks who are arrested by governments or states um, because of their religious beliefs or lack thereof are not able to have a public presence. Their stories fly under the radar. In this case, that's not true. Mubarak is a public presence in Nigeria and around the world. Um, and so we are able to take a take a stand for him, but also for members of the community who may not be able to have their voices heard during other times. Um, so there's what you can do. Uh, and thank you for that question. So, okay, I'm coming back to you, Sarah. <laughs> so um, the response of liberals and the left to the plight of ex-Muslims so far has been disappointing in India and in response to deaths in Pakistan. Um, what do you, how do you feel the that politicians and especially the left who you would think, I would think might have a vested interest in this. Um, what do you think of their response here in the United States? Uh, well, I've been, I've been pretty openly critical of it um, and I make no qualms about it um, in, in terms of my disappointment at first, it felt like uh, I, was, I was quite angry and I felt very much betrayed by, by the left um, because I felt as if that there was not enough support 
um, for ex-Muslims and kind of uh, whitewashing of what was happening um, within Islamic communities, within Muslim communities, in order to uh, protect Muslims as a minority within the United States. Um, and I, I felt as if that that line is actually not as difficult to walk as the left uh, broadly makes it out to be. And I think there's a lot of uh, clumsy moves and uh, signaling that isn't um, appropriate. Um, and and in, in doing so, it creates this environment where ex-Muslims often feel as if we can, we're not going to be heard on on platforms that are more progressive and on the left. And this is this makes it very difficult to get our word out, very difficult to be heard with with the people that we want to speak to. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, it, you know, if the only people who are who are opening up their platforms to you are those on 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 the right, then that's what you're going to do. You know, you're going to if 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 this is the number one most important issue to you and this is the issue closest to your heart, you just want to be heard. Um, it's very human to say, okay, well, I'll take that interview and I'll take that um, uh, that platform because that's all I can get, and that's the only place I can go without being demonized. So, unfortunately, that's the that's the reality facing a lot of ex-Muslims. That even though the vast vast majority of ex-Muslims that I know, and we've actually done surveys of our members, we know that it's like ninety five percent are strong call themselves very progressive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like it's so it's yeah. such a high percentage of of, of people that feel as if they fit that that political um, uh, side of the aisle, but they, they do not feel represented. Um, and in fact, they feel betrayed. In fact, they feel as if um, Muslim uh, practices like the hijab are glorified um, when they should not be. So, uh, I mean, I've been very critical of this. I do understand wh why it's happening, even though I, I'm frustrated by it, in that there's a tradition on the left to be supportive of, of kind of the underdogs, but also the opposing forces to the, to, the, to the main broad majority group, whatever that may be. And that even happens in India, which is so interesting to me, <laughs> that in India, there's this movement of, of uh, right-wing nationalists, um, Hindu right-wing nationalists, um, who are quite prominent and now getting more prominent um, in Hindu uh, mainstream society. So the left there uh, is, is almost, it behaves in a reactionary way, in my opinion, which says, well, we don't like this kind of nationalism and this kind of bigotry. So we're going to, uh, we're going to champion Muslims. And that's wonderful, championing them as a minority with certain freedoms uh, within their constitution, but they go a step further and they start whitewashing the, the uh, religious extremism of many Muslims in India, which is, which is, which is a real problem. Um, so it's interesting to see those dynamics kind of mirror in other parts of the world where Muslims are a minority and there's another different kind of majority. There's what's happening in the West, but also you, we can see that in places like uh, India. Um, so I think that, that, that uh, that's really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I've, uh, I mean, I've heard you speak about that for a number of conferences and years, and I think maybe since XMNA started. So <laughs> definitely an issue that's not going away. Um, so this question is from an Indian ex-Muslim who lives in Utah, noting that there's been a mass exodus of Mormons from the Church of Great Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints lately because of an increasing awareness of LDS scripture and sort of their lack of uh, honesty or, or applicability to reality. Um, so do you see, is XMNA involved in interfaith dialogue uh, with both ex-Muslims and Muslims about Islamic scriptures? And when you, if you are, do you speak to sort of the truthfulness or accuracy of um, Islamic scriptures or, or other beliefs? So interfaith is an interesting word. I don't like it in the sense of... <laughs> I struggle I with interfaith because I often feel like interfaith efforts exclude non-religious voices, which is yes. such a growing population. It's the we all agree on God and we all agree. <laughs> like it's, it's, exactly. it, it feels often like a kumbaya session and not something that's very productive. I think it makes a lot of people feel good. And then they feel as if, but it tends to also be, from my experience with interfaith groups, people who are highly educated, very, very liberal and in liberal communities and societies themselves. So very liberal, you know, Unitarian type Christians and very liberal Muslims and very liberal Jews and highly educated people who don't have the experience of religion that I had and, and you know, right. that, that the average religious person might have who come together and say, hey, 
we have you and I have more in common than, than, you know, we have uh, different and that's actually true for them because they're very educated and they're well off and they're liberal and they're, they're, right. you know, they share, they do share a lot of things. It's true. Um, but that's not, that, that doesn't necessarily tell you anything about religion. Um, and so I think that's it's, sometimes it can be a little bit self-congratulatory um, for my taste. <laughs> so, uh, no, we have not had too much interfaith dialogue, but we end up uh, speaking a lot to Muslims. I mean, we gear what we're doing and what we're saying to Muslims. Um, a lot of uh, what, what people are aware of my, in my talks, I talk to um, Americans. So sometimes I'm speaking to an American audience. I'm talking about ideological issues here. Um, and so a lot of people know of me as, as somebody who speaks uh, about those issues, but the, the vast majority of our work is geared towards Muslims. And I'm hoping to, to capture, you know, a, a 15 year old, 16 year old who is maybe questioning or who is thinking about, okay, well, I have these questions about my faith. I know my faith is right. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to study up on them so I can defend my faith better or just feel more comfortable about it. And I'm hoping that they find one of our videos, find one of our articles and, and you know, see things from our perspective. Um, because I do think there's something about direct engagement, like when you're debating with someone directly, it can feel a little confrontational and they might not, just because you you know, it's that antagonistic relationship, they might not give up uh, <laughs> at, right at that moment. But passive um, influence, like what you might get when you're reading an article that an ex-Muslim wrote, or watching a video and you don't feel personally attacked by it, but you do kind of you know, you feel like they are challenging your viewpoint a little bit. I think that's a lot more effective in changing the hearts and minds of people. Um, when I was leaving religion, I was, you know, a teenager. All I could find when it came to criticism of Islam that, that made sense to me as somebody who was questioning God, like the entire concept of God, it either came from just, uh, you know, atheists who were criticizing Christianity and talking about Christianity um, or these uh, anti-Muslim Christians. <laughs> who would criticize Islam, right. but not, not Christianity. And those were the sources available to me. Um, still and still providing you really with an, an outlet. Right, right. And so uh, you know, what I did was I applied those atheist arguments to my, to, to my religion and uh, applied those anti-Muslim you know, anti Christian arguments to Christianity and uh, formed my worldview based on that. But that was an active process that I took on because I was wanting to do it. I was wanting to find a resolution to the dissonance in my head. But a lot of people run away from the, that dissonance because it's very painful. You don't want to end up on the other side and feel alienated from your community. So I think there, there's a lot of times where emotion uh, motivates uh, where we allow reason to guide us and, mm -hmm. and you know, whether we allow reason to guide us. And in this case, um, in, in this case, I, I, what I want to, to do is to make it easier for people emotionally uh, to understand what I'm saying intellectually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so some of the, the one of the first projects that I did when we were able to when we were able to muster up uh, the the uh, equipment and time to make it happen was uh, the mini documentaries that are just you know all they really are are ex-Muslims from all different paths of life who look very different. Uh, talking about themselves for a couple of minutes, uh, five to seven minutes. And the idea was just to capture these people, these their, their lives and show how different ex-Muslims look like. And the, my hope was that there would be somebody who, you know, looks at say, you know, the, the, the 25 year old woman, Hina, who we, who we covered and says, she sounds like my sister, you know, she sounds like me. And actually I've had that thought. Um, and the hope was that that allows them emotionally to be more receptive to all the intellectual problems. And I often find that once that path is clear, um, once, once it's easier for them to walk, there, walk that way, uh, that it, they'll find that, okay, they've already had those thoughts. They've already had those doubts. They just never allowed them to really impact uh, their you know, core ideology. They just held them at a distance there and stopped thinking about them. So I think that some of what we're doing has to be, uh, it has to keep in mind the psychological reasons why irrationality is, you know, and, and, and dogma is so commonplace and so alluring to people. Right. Um, okay, so it looks like some of your comments started, a, some of your answers started a, a, a vigorous conversation in the group chat. 
um, about this sort of idea of the left prioritizing this defense of Islam. Um, and like you said, whitewashing or otherwise ignoring people who are victimized uh, by that faith. Um, why do you think that is? Why, why do I think that that happens or why do I think people love talking about it? <laughs> <laughs> both. Can you answer both? <laughs> I think people love talking. People love culture wars. They love it. And that's what this is. It touches on culture war issues and, and that's, it's sexy and it's heated. And so people like it. I'm actually bored of it. So I'm <laughs> honest because I've been talking about it since day one. Right. And I'm just, uh, you know, it's no longer challenging or interesting to me anymore. Um, but I think that this is, it, it is something that we can, we can get past. Um, it, it, it does require people to be courageous because I know that there are a lot of people, I would even say many majority, you know, people on the left on, on who are progressive, who understand where we're coming from. Um, but they just don't want to do any harm. They don't, they just don't want to hurt this small minority that they're seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it, this is the case and this is the problem with insular communities. And this is something that uh, Amalki Schwartz, who is the uh, founder of Footsteps, who um, she and I have been talking and working together on that other organization. Um, she, she discussed, we've had lots of conversations about this, which is that because you're in an insular community, all the, all the harm of that community is hidden. It's not publicly visible. The children who are not getting ad adequate education, adequate healthcare, adequate um, support or, um, or safety from, say, sexual predation um, or, you know, inappropriate grooming, they're not, they're not heard, they're not seen mm -hmm. because of the nature of the insular community. You're not going to hear those voices. And because you're not going to hear them and see them on a day-to-day -day basis, you're not going to be able to empathize with it. So what you might be able to empathize with is the hijabi girl who, who is made fun of on the bus because you saw that. Mm -hmm. You saw that that happened and you said, oh no, and you understood that as a real experience, but you don't see anything else that happens throughout her, her day and anything else, any other pressure that she might be facing in her home. And she might even be one of the many women who are forced into hijab, who, are, who don't feel like that, 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 who feel like that they have to do this mm -hmm. um, in order to please their family. That, that's all that stuff that's not visible, that can't be seen. So it is harder to empathize with. Um, simply because of that fact. So I am hoping that if we can make these things more visible um, and we can just, just raise awareness of what's going on, people will at least intellectually understand the complexity of these issues. Um, and so that can at the very least make it harder for people to go through with a full-throated defense of Islam, which unfortunately I have seen and it's ridiculous, but I have seen it. Um, so hopefully that it will at the very least hinder that sort of behavior and even that will go a long way um to, to helping ex-muslims great so this one is sort of two parts um from two different folks and so i'm rephrasing a little bit uh so 12 a, a number of countries either have the death penalty for apostasy or blasphemy uh or have penalized or otherwise made it illegal to leave islam um, when you're talking to folks who don't necessarily understand that or have any experience with that level of state response, how do you sort of steer the discussion towards that idea of rights and realities on the ground for people who are trying to leave Islam versus getting stuck in the sort of theological higher like level discussions that I think many folks in our circles are want to have? You know, I, I think it's, I, I don't actually have an answer to that of how to do that well. Um, and this is something that we've been discussing quite a bit within, you know, XMNA leadership and, and, and trying to get our messaging right. Um, mm -hmm. That sometimes when the horror of a situation is so extreme, it is uh, hard to imagine and hard to believe. Um, mm -hmm. So even if one says, okay, this is what happened to me, this is what I went through, this is my reality, it's because it is so far away from someone's experience um, or just so horrifying at the face of it um, that people cannot, they cannot empathize um, and they on some level do not even believe it. Like it's like a movie and it's not something that happens to real people. Um, it's something that happens to someone else very far away uh, who, who is not human like them. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, I think it's very easy 
to fall into that to, to fall into that pattern of not looking at somebody like Mubarak Bala and seeing somebody like yourself um, and seeing somebody with the wants and desires that you have. Um, but unfortunately, in the you know 70 odd years we have, you know, in, in this life, we're going to spend it a lot more freely than he will. Um, and that's just, that's a reality. And it's a painful real, reality. And I think it's something that, it, that we cannot intuitively grasp. Um, and it's, this is one of the reasons when people, you know, when they see, uh, when they go to places where there are horrors and they see, uh, see that happening in real life, that they, you know, see this, let's say, in detention camps and on the border, they, they see people there. It shakes them and moves them in a way that just hearing about it just couldn't. Um, because it becomes real all of a sudden, and that it's fun of in, that it's in front of you. And I think that that's a challenge of raising awareness about ex-Muslim issues on a uh, on the whole, and even in particular this this issue with Mubarak Bala. Like like okay, who is this guy? You know, I don't know. I he has a strange name. What's his background? What's you know? Maybe I, I don't know much about him or anything. About him. <laughs> oh, dog. <laughs> um, is, so I think that's a it, that's a very real challenge, um, and that's a very real challenge uh, as we're forming global communities of ideologically minded, you know, ideologically minded communities. Let's say of humanists, of humanists working together across the globe. I think this is a challenge. Um, I I'm not sure how to bridge it. Um, the only thing I can do is try to evoke uh, f feelings of uh, you know uh, of, of of empathy by by asking them questions of what if this happened to your brother? <laughs> you know, what if, uh, what if your, your daughter was, was the one who was forced into the hijab from age eight, you know, and was told that this is the way to live modestly. And, and I hope that that'll give them a kernel of understanding. In the case of a situation like, uh, you know, Nigeria and Pakistan, which is so much worse and, uh, and Saudi Arabia, it's very hard to imagine because the entire world is different. Um, so it's something I, I don't have an answer to. That's a long way of saying I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> okay, sorry, that was my dog, um, but she's calmed down now. Uh, I think, so this is sort of a follow-up to that question. Obviously here in the United States and in um, Western European countries, we don't have the kind of apostasy or blasphemy laws that countries like Nigeria and Pakistan and Bangladesh do, um, but obviously there's still a threat. So how do those sort of reactions play out in Western communities where that response may not necessarily be legal, it may not be codified, what does it look like in communities on the ground? Well, most often it's um, social pressure and abuse from family. So it, it, it might just be in, 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 a, in a more extreme, but unfortunately not rare case, it would be parents abusing, physically abusing their children. Um, and that's unfortunately common and common enough that we tell our advice in general is not to come out to parents until someone is in a position where they can live by themselves, which is to say financially, financial independence. Until they've achieved that, we recommend that they don't say anything and play, play along and be in the closet just for their own safety because it is just, uh, you don't know what's gonna happen. And a lot of people imagine that they know how their parents are going to react and uh, you really can't tell. And you know, sometimes conservative parents are more accepting than you would think, and sometimes uh, liberal parents uh, take you back on a family trip to Jordan and you're never seen again. Um, so this is, uh, unfortunately, this is one of those things where we tell people to take the cautious route uh, because you just don't know what's, what, what's going to happen. And the fear is, is uh, that, especially with minors, that they will be taken back home, which is to say taken back to a Muslim uh, majority country that, you know, the origin country is very common uh, to be threatened by this. Um, and then it does unfortunately happen. It happens quite a bit in Somali communities with a practice called duck, is, duck and phallus. Um, and it's also uh, happens in South Asian communities that you just, now it's time to go back home. You're a little too westernized. Um, so uh, blasphemy is one of those things where we, we tell people you can be open eventually, you can be yourself, but you must make sure that you have, that you are able to take care of yourself and you can get out if you need to get out. If you're a minor, that is very, very, very difficult to do. So we, we don't, uh, we encourage them not to do it here. Wow, that's sobering and, and challenging. 
Um, okay, so we're going to do one more question, and I know that there are a lot more than one on the chat, and so I'm sorry um, that we weren't able to get to all of them. Uh, and then, um, and then after this question, if uh, Sarah and Christine, you can close us out by um, telling us how we can support uh, XMNA and Atheists United. Um, and Sarah, again, thank you so much for being here and doing this. Thank you. Great. So our last question is, um, you know, we're going to end on a current event here. Uh, so given the already complex challenges of leaving Islam or a Muslim community, right now, obviously, quarantine uh, or other pandemic responses can require uh, or force folks to live with family members who are either believers or, um, uh, you know, especially strict about these practices. Does XMNA have members in this situation that you're aware of? And is there something we can do? How can we support uh, folks who might be in quarantine and maybe even more closed off um, from that accessibility than usual? Yeah, I mean, and this is one of those things This happens um, around Ramadan time as well. And Ramadan just passed. Um, but it's, 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 Ramadan is usually a challenging time for XMNA because our members need more assistance because they often have more engagements with family around that time. They're spending more time with their family. Um, so uh, it's a time where we're a little bit stressed in terms of staff uh, and volunteer hours, but at the same time, we have fewer staff and volunteer hours because many of our volunteers are in the closet themselves and have to, <laughs> they have to go to prayer and they have to uh, do the whole rigmarole themselves. Um, so it's it's a similar situation for us as what happens in in Ramadan, which is that this is the time to be very connected online um, to the extent that we can be, and we are so so lucky that we have uh, the internet and we have the ability to connect online. If it wasn't for uh, the fact that we can do this, XMNA could not have existed. It could not have formed um, because there's just not enough of us that are willing to be open in our communities for us to have naturally connected without the anonymizing. Uh, assistance of the internet, the ability to form connections and engage in work and even, you know, give money uh, to, to people who are doing the kind of work that you want to do online anonymously. Uh, that ability has saved us and that that is why we're able to succeed in a way that we've never been able to succeed before. So it is, it is one of those things that ex-Muslims have been terribly persecuted throughout history, uh, continue to be persecuted now However, we have a chance of changing the reality for ex-Muslims um, and for, you know, free thinkers in any part of the world, any part of the non-free world in a way that we just haven't had before. And I think we, um, uh, we must uh, take this chance and, and, and be wary of all the ways that it can be, you know, thwarted. And one thing to watch out for, it somewhat seems like it's tangential, but it is not, is to pay attention to what social media companies are doing. Um, in terms of, of, of abuse uh, and protecting um, ex-Muslims, protecting people online, protecting their anonymity, how, uh, how and to what extent they're cooperating with governments um, who are uh, uh, persecuting um, ex-Muslims or apostates or atheists. Um, we've been working with uh, the Secular Coalition for America and Center for Inquiry um, they've been assisting us in, in, in getting the Free Thought Caucus uh, involved on some of these issues. We found that uh, Facebook's abuse sy uh, flagging systems are very, very easy to mechanize, um, to abuse, um, and to get ex-Muslim groups um, shut down, to get ex-Muslim accounts shut down. It's very easy for them to do it. They have numbers on their side and they're very organized. Um, and so we've been working to try and ease this situation to the best of our ability. So I would say that that's something, uh, generally speaking, uh, these online uh, social media platforms, they really, this is the public square now, and it is a very vital one, especially for people who do not live in free societies or even free communities in free societies. Um, so it's, it's uh, that's something to pay attention to because that's one of those things that has uh, broad effects for freedom everywhere. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I wouldn't have even, my mind wouldn't have even gone to thinking about social media companies sort of policing, uh, either policing people speaking about leaving Islam or um, allowing people to weaponize it against 
folks who disagree. Uh, okay, great. So Christine, if you want to tell us how we can um, support Atheist United and wrap us up, and then Sarah, um, if you can give us the Atheist, I mean the Ex-Muslims North America website and what, um, how, how you can best utilize our support right now. Uh, and then we'll wrap tonight up. Great. Um, yeah, thank you, Sarah, for officiating this um, discussion, and also Sarah Henry. And also <laughs> thank you, Sarah Bader, for your insights on a very complex and serious topic that uh, these are the conversations that need to be ongoing and consistent um, here in the West and everywhere around the world. Um, I also want to um, uh, make it clear that this, just remind people that this is a campaign for to free Mubarak Bala and to go to the freemubarakbala.org website to um, uh, find out what more you can do for that. And Sarah has already explained that. Um, you can contribute to his legal fund. Um, and also, we are all brothers and sisters in the secular movement. And I encourage everybody to contribute to their local secular organizations as well as their national secular organizations such as uh, American Atheists, but also um, the XMNA, which is also a national organization, I believe. Um, so wherever, uh, whatever seems to suit your um, personal interests, do contribute to your secular organizations. And with that, I'll uh, let Sarah go ahead and close this out. Yeah, um, thank you so much for everyone for joining and, and please, please pay attention to the uh, free Mubarak Bala campaign. There's a hashtag and the work of Humanist International. They have a action alert uh, page that has a lot of information about this case. Um, it's easy to ignore cases like this. They happen too often, unfortunately, but these are real people. Um, and they are, uh, especially in the case of uh, Mubarak, he has been uh, doing real work to change the reality uh, for, for individuals, especially for humanists and atheists on the ground uh, where it's needed most. Uh, so pay attention to this and uh, help uh, raise awareness about what's going on. Um, and if you want to hear about XMNA, um, there are, social media is the best way to do it. We are active everywhere <laughs> on, on social media with the uh, name xmuslims.org. Our website is xmuslims.org. Our YouTube is xmuslims.org. Uh, Twitter as everything. So just that that's the way to find out what we're doing. Um, I would especially um, follow our YouTube account. We are going to have more content on there coming up soon. We're really excited about um, and I think you guys will um, enjoy it and find it very educational. Great. And like I said, I feel like every time I see more XMNA YouTube content and it's especially useful to those of us who have very had very little exposure to, to that experience growing up. So Thank you all for joining, for the incredibly insightful and thoughtful questions, for allowing me to stand in as uh, Evan Clark was not able to be here, but I know was very upset um, he missed it. And, uh, and I'm sure we will all talk soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys.